Good morning, all. Hi, um, my name is Hari Prasad, and I work with Team Indus as an avionics engineer in the command and data handling team. Team Indus, and my today's talk is going to be about the journey of Team Indus, is um, the audacious journey of a bunch of explorers, dreamers, and achievers, which started in about 2011 with a vision to put India in the global map of deep technology. Team Indus started as a hypothesis, an uh, impossible dream of, its, of, it, of a sort, uh, when it started about seven years ago. The genesis of Team Indus comes from the idea that cutting edge space exploration can happen in the private domain, and that too out of India. Today, Team Indus is an established aerospace company. We believe that new world thinking will help us approach the challenges of the future and come up with path-breaking engineering solutions for these problems. Based out of Bangalore, my team and I are building a spacecraft capable of soft landing on the lunar surface and deploying a rover on the lunar surface. This is a feat which has been achieved in the past only by the governments of the US, the USSR, and China. So what is all this? excitement about space exploration. Why space? I mean, there could be so much we could be exploring. Why space? And how does it help the common man? Take, for instance, this image behind me. This is an image from a weather satellite. We have satellites deployed about the Earth, which help us in a lot of our day-to-day -day activities. GPS navigation to take an Uber from point A to point B. We want to help monitor crop health. You want to understand what is the atmospheric phenomenon, understand climate change. We have space tech involved in almost every day-to-day -day life activities today. There's a little more to this image. It's my story of how I got into space tech. Not too long ago, I was a student, and I was working on a project to build a ground station to help receive weather satellite images for easy dissemination for people who need it. This image was a result of that project. And this project was my first step into the world of space tech and space exploration. But in taking this step, I've joined the ranks of a bunch of people, countless number of people actually, who are trying hard to break the barriers of the final frontier. Space today is, a, is more than a $300 billion industry, but privatization has shown that it can make things efficient and cheaper to get things up to space and on other territories like the Moon and Mars today. It's said that SpaceX has 80% of its components built in-house and rather efficiently helping them reduce uh, launch cost by a factor of up to 10. We have seen stories where privatization in the space industry has had remarkable uh, results. You can launch a Tesla Roadster to space you can have multiple boosters land again on the Earth for reuse. This has been achieved in the private space sector. Keeping this in mind, back in 2007, the XPRIZE Foundation instituted the Google Lunar XPRIZE. The Google Lunar XPRIZE, the premise was that it was to invite private industries to soft land on the moon, traverse 500 meters, transmit high-definition images back from the moon to the Earth with not more than 10% government funding. The entire system had to be done with 90% private funds. This is where Team Indus came in. The Google Lunar X Prize was a catalyst for Team Indus to enter the aerospace uh, industry. But when we entered the industry, we were rank outsiders. And today, we are potentially at the cusp of history, trying to land the world's first privately managed lunar spacecraft on the moon. In 2011, we registered for the competition. By 2013, we had the first versions of our spacecraft and the rover ready. In 2014, we demonstrated our landing technology, which won us the Terrestrial Milestone Prize from GLXP. This was a prize pouch of about $1 million. This gave us a lot of validation. We continued progressing with the designs, refining it, testing it, working on the qualification across 2015, 16, 17. And by 
about 2016, we knew that the implications of such a mission is way beyond that of the scope of the competition. We are in this for the long run. In 2017, we had a bunch of judges coming from JLXP to look at our progress. And this was the much needed validation for us to get this mission landing on the moon as soon as possible. Our first moon mission is primarily going to be a technology demonstrator. It is for us to show that we can have precision landing, rover deployment, all autonomously done by the onboard computer in the first mission. This confidence will help us over the next five years to plan our further missions where we plan to increase the payload capacity. Payload is a cargo you take to, to the moon in this case. Moon is becoming a very important subject matter today with a lot of countries focusing on developing their lunar systems to ensure that this helps in further space exploration. You want to go to Mars, stop by on the moon, refuel and head to Mars. You want to go beyond Mars, moon is the first outpost you're starting at. We are getting into a time in history where space resources are going to be utilized for the progress of humanity. And moon is a primary factor in this growth. And Team Indus is working on developing systems to enable better payload delivery to the moon, work on better science class orbiters to orbit the moon, to have sample return missions from the moon back to the Earth to study it better. It's not easy to go to the moon. A moon mission has its technical challenges. The primary one is that the moon is very far. Very, very, very far. This image you see out there was taken by Voyager spacecraft, the Voyager 1, in 1977. It was the first image where the Earth and the Moon were captured in a single frame. When this image was taken, the spacecraft was 12 million kilometers far from Earth. And the distance between the Earth and the Moon is 385,000 kilometers. Just to give an idea of scale again, imagine I shrink the Earth to the size of a basketball. On this scale, all the common space tech we know, satellites, uh, International Space Station, the Space Shuttle, uh, weather satellites, they all orbit the Earth, and this would be about an inch or two from the surface of this basketball, an inch or two. Now the moon, on the same scale, is no bigger than a tennis ball. If I place the basketball Earth here, the moon is, is gonna be beyond the stage, over seven and a half meters away. And remember, that first one inch is where most of the space tech happens today, and we're trying to go all the way from here one inch across the stage to the tiny tennis ball of moon there. The other challenges in space, especially with the moon, are the hostile environments. You don't have an atmosphere, you're in near vacuum, the temperature variations are crazy. On the moon, the one single lunar day is 29.5 Earth days. What does this mean for us? It means the temperature variations on the surface of the moon goes from plus 150 degrees Celsius during the lunar day to minus 150 degrees Celsius during the lunar night. What does this mean for technology, for equipment? The metal warps, electronic circuitry, the soldering breaks. Things do not last in such crazy temperature variations. Most missions today focus on surviving just the primary lunar day, the 14 days is when you get most of your work done. Compounded is the fact that there's near vacuum you don't have the effects of the atmosphere to distribute temperature around the surface. You're stuck in a highly concentrated area of heat and without much to dissipate it off somewhere else. There is no cooling effect of the atmosphere on the moon. With all these challenges, engineers uh, back in my team spent time, developed designs to get the system to land on the moon and survive it, sending back valuable data back to the Earth. So the first mission comprises of these three things. We have a rover, we call it uh, Ekchoti Si Asha, and we have the lander, we call it the Ham Honge Kamiyap. And this rover sits in the lander, and when the lander lands on the moon, it'll deploy it and the rover will go on to perform its functions. This entire lander with the rover sits on top of a launch vehicle, which takes us uh, on a lunar transfer trajectory, which puts the uh, spacecraft on a uh, on a perigee of 280 kilometers, an apogee of 380,000 kilometers. What is the spacecraft? To get into the details, uh, the first part is 
the spacecraft bus. This is what you physically see. It's the structure, it's what has all the components mounted on it. This structure is very important because space is expensive. The more mass you take to space, the more propellant you need, the more money you need. Everything comes down to the amount of mass you can carry up beyond Earth orbit. Which is why low cost launches are um, incidentally so important. So what goes into the spacecraft bus is very lightweight aluminum. You have to make sure the center of gravity is low so that when it lands on the moon, it doesn't topple over in case there's any problem. You land on a rock or a crater. You need to make sure that your spacecraft can handle the shock and the vibrations of a launch. The shock and the vibrations observed during a launch on any craft is immense. It'll rattle anything we can put into space. It involves a lot of redundant designs to make sure the entire spacecraft stays in one single piece and is light at the same time. This is a big challenge. The next part in the spacecraft physical part is the thermal management. Space, as I said, does not have the features of an atmosphere, the regulatory features of an atmosphere. You have a spacecraft traversing from the Earth to the Moon. You have one side of the craft getting very hot, the other side getting cold. So you have heaters to heat up the cold sides. You have radiators and reflectors to dissipate heat from the hot sides. There's a lot of thermal management involved in a spacecraft. Another part which is very important to any spacecraft design is a propulsion system. Propulsion system is what are the engines of a craft. It's what helps you move from A to B. These are achieved by main engines and thrusters. These basically provide the thrust required to move in space. Our spacecraft has 16 thrusters for attitude control and to help in landing, and a main engine which helps in orbit changing maneuvers as well as in the distance strategy. Another major component of the spacecraft is all the electronics that goes into it. There's power to be generated while you're going from A to B, from the moon to the earth, earth to the moon. Uh, you carry a battery, but it cannot handle all the uh, requirements for the entire uh, duration of the mission. So you generate power in orbit, you generate power while you have landed on the moon using solar panels. We already mentioned how the moon is very, very far from Earth. And you need to establish high bandwidth, reliable communication between the Earth and the moon. This makes use of high bandwidth transmission systems on the spacecraft. There is a spacecraft comm link between the spacecraft as well as the rover when the rover is deployed on the moon. At any point of time, there should be link with the spacecraft. The most important part in the electronics is the onboard computer, the brains of the spacecraft. This handles thermal management, when to turn on heaters, when to turn off heaters. This handles thruster firing, how much to fire a thruster, how long, how much orbit change maneuvers. It handles the orbit change maneuvers. And more importantly, the onboard computer completely autonomously handles the lunar descent. I'm gonna play a video of uh, some of the testing we do on the spacecraft. Any system we build needs to be tested to ensure that it works in space. Once we launch something from Earth, it has to absolutely work. We cannot stop the craft somewhere, go back, re-engineer, tinker around with wires, and send it back on its way. Once it's gone, it's gone. It's very important to make sure that whatever is deployed is in its best working condition. So we have a lot of tests. Uh, the one which is gonna be featured was the landing, uh, landing legs of the spacecraft being tested as a drop test. We um, put the electronics through a lot of testing uh, in terms of thermal cycles, in terms of vibration, in terms of vacuum, and get everything tested or understood as simulations before we end up going for the launch. How do we get to the moon? Uh, we get launched in a lunar transfer trajectory which puts us all the way close to the moon. And once you get to about 100 kilometers off the surface of the moon, you start going around the moon and slowly getting closer and closer to the surface. We're about 12 kilometers at the perigee and about 100 kilometers at the apogee. In the, the fourth orbit where you get very close to the moon, the autonomous uh, onboard computer takes over to ensure we have a smooth, soft landing on the moon. This is a, a rough look of how the command control works. We are in contact with the spacecraft every single minute. We get data, health parameters, and we also send telecommands for how to, what the next operation of the spacecraft or the rover should be. All this is just to take some cargo to the moon. This is what the business of lunar logistics is. We are already in the first mission carrying payloads from research institutes like Indian Institute of Astrophysics, 
the Italian National Astrophysics Institute, to name a few. We are also carrying a few uh, suit of experiments uh, designed by students on this, along with uh, HD cameras from the French National Space Agency. This is the team which helps put everything together. We are about 100 strong with collaborations across the world to ensure our spacecraft safely reaches the moon's surface. This would not be possible without all the backers who understand the importance of this mission in India's growth and future. We believe we have a responsibility to include the greater public and the society at large in this mission to make it a Har Indian Ka Moonshot. What do we mean by Har Indian Ka Moonshot? We had a lot of programs where we take science, technology, engineering, mathematics to a lot of people. Our first initiative was called the Moonshot Wheels, where we took uh, an immersive lab with lunar uh, scale models, with lunar surface simulants, and a couple of experiments to government schools across India. It's done over 11 states. Uh, we have about 12,500 kilometers driven, and lots of students who have benefited from this program. We also worked on a program called Lab to Moon. Uh, we, had, we hosted a competition for students all over the world to submit proposals to an experiment to be done on the moon. This was a result of it. We had over 3,000 entries, out of which we are flying about six experiments to the moon. We are also working on getting girls in STEM to better involve kids, especially girls, in the STEM fields as early as possible. This is an image taken from the Apollo 8 mission. It was the first Earthrise image ever captured. This is very close to my heart. And my moonshot in this entire mission is to make sure that through the eyes of our rover, we get to capture more of these Earthrises. This is my moonshot. What is your moonshot going to be? Thank you.